Yep. Right. Good morning. Can you? Yeah. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Apologies for the technical issues that we have we're having at the moment. Hopefully, this time it works fine. So, as I was saying, welcome to this webinar in which we'll be presenting our flexible mobility accounts uh, code that is currently open. I'm Javier Pardo Diaz, and I'm a senior portfolio manager at the Skills and Careers Unit at BDSRC. With me is here today, Aidan Grimsley, who will be answering your questions in the chat. So first, I will present, I will present really how webinar will work. First, I will give a quick introduction to the award to the FTMAs. Then we'll give some examples on some uh, activities that we funded through a 3D school in previous years. Then we will uh, present how the opportunity has designed with three of the main highlights that are partnerships, the priority areas that, that are included in the core, and the, the equality, diversity, and inclusion aspects of the core. And uh, lastly, well, lastly, no, sorry, then we will uh, uh, summarize the questions that are in the application and that applicants will have to, be, uh, to respond, and also the how we will assess the applications and the time frame of the core. At the end, there will be a time for uh, for you to ask some questions, uh, and we will try to uh, reply them. Uh, this webinar is going is being recorded, and we will be, we will add later to the UKRI uh, website along a frequently asked uh, questions document. And these documents will include some questions that we've uh, prepared about uh, and that we that we already had, and also the questions raised during this webinar. If you have any question, please use the Q&A box here in the on Zoom, and uh, we will try to answer them either orally or by typing. So let's begin. So what are FTMAs? These, uh, these awards are institutional awards, which means that, in that institu are institutions who will, who will, who, which we will receive the money and are expected to internally identify appropriate activities to fund using the award. This is, the awards will not be given to individual investigation, event investigators in a research organization. The aim of these awards are to enable placements or secondments for research staff to work outside their usual environments and pursue training activities. We aim to support with these awards a wide range of research staff, including postdocs, technicians, uh, acknowledged state staff, senior researchers, and more. The, these awards can act as a training platform for individuals to increase the, and increase the porosity between sectors. As I suggest, these awards are very flexible in terms of the nature, duration, and location of the, of, the activity, of the activities, as well as the collaborators that might, be, might get involved uh, in the delivery of the awards. Uh, with this goal, BSRC will commit a minimum of three million Pounds over the three next over the next three years, and we found ten proposals. Each proposal will be awarded a, around one hundred twenty-five k pounds per year, of which well, the, a, the awards will be around one hundred twenty-five k pounds per year, with with social funding eighty percent of the full economic cost of the proposals. These are three years a long awards that will run from April twenty twenty-four until March twenty twenty-seven with an annual review during April this year. This uh, annual review will potentially lead to an uh, increase or decrease on, on the funding of the project for the following year. Here, I will present some of the activities that we have previously uh, funded. For example, the Edisa partnership uh, in which the Erham Institute uh, participated. So the Erham Institute staff developed training videos on the operation of some of their equipment. And these videos were used for training the staff and also for helping collaborators to assess the suitability of their equipment. Another example is, uh, it was a, a partnership between the University of Bristol and Skin, and Skinfluence in which the RGPs, research and technical professionals, attended, attended workshops to better understand industry needs and 
uh, so that they could identify industrial collaborators and opportunities to, uh, that fit their skills outside the academia. Also, we have an example from Imperial College in which a postdoc developed a novel uh, micro microscopy technique, and this allowed them to uh, get a patent uh, by protecting this technique and a uh, future collaboration with industry in which this, in which the, well, that has led to the supervision of two PhD students, co-supervisions between the Imperial College and Ma Manchester Biogel of two PhD students. Just example I'm going to explain is a, a postdoc from UCL that engaged with a small cheese maker to learn some traditional cheese, uh, some traditional cheese making techniques and investigating the microbiological microbiol microbiological diversity, uh, how uh, the microbiological diversity affects the properties of diseases. This postdoc gains uh, access to some unique microbi microbiological cultures, and uh, the cheese maker gains a deeper understanding of how well the biology behind this process. So as you can see, these activities are very flexible and they can involve uh, different sets of partners. And as I said before, it, it their aim to increase porosity and move uh, and yeah and yeah, placements for um research staff to learn new techniques or develop some uh, develop uh, their professional their professional career uh, uh, in a different environment to the one they are usually used uh, they are usually in. So going into the how the opportunity is designed. We've created the uh, we've created a uh, this partnership. Uh, the arrows need to apply in partnerships, and with this we aim to maximize the impact of the awards by enhancing new collaborations and strengthening existing ones. This is uh, uh, with this we mean that we aim for re the research organizations, the arrows across the UK, to share the collaboration collaboration networks and their expertise. For this per for this reason. This is an open call to all the arrows eligible for BDSRC funding, uh, but and the applications must come from partnerships between at least two eligible arrows, and one and one arrow cannot be a partner in multiple FTMA partnerships for this call. Here, it's important to discuss the difference that we've made between partners and collaborators. For one side, on one side, partners are, are arrows that will have to be arrows that are eligible for BDSRC funding and have to contribute to the application design and the project governance. These partners must be named in the application and provide a letter of support, supporting the project and that they will be well, that they will be involved in this project. Its partner, its partnership needs to be at it needs to be at least of two partners, but there, we have not, but there's not a maximum number of partners in a part in, in a partnership. And as I said before, an eligible arrow cannot be cannot be a partner in multiple FTMA applications. On the other side, collaborators can be any organization or institution, either in the UK or overseas, and these are involved in the delivery of the activities, including the proposal. They can they, they are not fixed in stone, and with this week we want to say that they can develop, develop over the course of the award, and there's not a minimum number required. Uh, in contrast with in difference with the partners, collaborators can collaborate in more than one application. Uh, and, and collaborators and partners in one application can be collaborators in a different one. For example, if partner if a uh, university, the University of Swinton, for example, already has uh, is already involved in a partnership for an FTMA in an FTMA proposal, they can be involved in a second one being as collaborators instead of partners. This is uh, for example, for example, providing a uh, staff to go into placement to other uh, to the other research organizations or to uh, the collaborators other collaborators they may have found found another another um, novelty that we have increased in this school are the priority areas uh, with this with these priority areas we aim to spread the awards across video across video source remits and address uh, the strategic training requirements of the bio biosciences workforce we have identified six priority areas that are a combination of the cross remit topics focused on the development of the skills of the bioscience workforce and also for the four research areas, uh, well, for research, uh, for research areas in the diversity remit related to the global objectives aligned with the UKRI strategic themes. You can find all the information and what we mean with 
these six criteria in the funding finder on the UK website. But as you can see on the screen, they are data intensive bioscience, in which and we am, uh, with um, in, uh, under this heading, we're looking for proposals focused on providing training on how to develop and use computational technologies and analytical approaches for la large scale biosciences data. We also have the engineering biology priority area that is focused on providing training for designing and fabricating biological components and systems that may be applied to a range of areas, for example, biomedicine or growth or environmental, or environmental solutions. And also, as I was saying, the four, four of the UKRI strategic themes, the security better health, aging, and well-being is focused on research areas such as uh, aging and health across the life course, health inequalities, and food and nutrition for health. The securing better health, aging, and well-being is, uh, sorry, the uh, tackling infections one is focused on providing training to staff working on biosciences research areas related to infectious animal, infectious animal disease and welfare, plant health, zoonosis and antimicrobial and my, antimicrobial, antimicrobial resistance. The one on building energy and green future is focused on a by the bioscience underpinning nature-based carbon sequestration and advanced manufacturing and the zero agri-food systems. And the secure and resilient uh, secure and resilient world is based, for example, in areas such as increasing increasing uh, to increasing our resilience of the food system and the food production, also and also nutrition security and uh, feed security. But as I said, all the all the all the uh, uh, this, the description of all these criteria can be found in the Finding Finder website. The idea of these criteria is that uh, its application at the application stage has to select one of those, and a minimum of the 70% of the full economic cost of the award must support activities within this criteria. This includes, for example, enabling mobility of individuals to pursue work within the priority area remit. Uh, also, it, it also includes training individuals who work within the limits of the priority area uh, to get some transferable skills of, of, of some training, and also includes training individual, individuals who do not work, who do not work within the limits of the priority area in the skills that are relevant to the priority area. For example, having the example of the data, uh, data uh, intensive data bioscience, this could be, for example, to enable mobility of, in the, of researchers working on this topic to industry or to other research organization. It would also give them a uh, training them in other area, uh, sorry, training them in yeah, any other research area or in, uh, uh, giving them some professional development course. Or, 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 it, could, or it can also, also include uh, some individuals working on other research area, for example, plant biology, biology to gain skills relevant to the uh, biosciences, uh, sorry, so, to the uh, data and a uh, computational bio biology area. One of the aspects that we want to highlight in this goal uh, is equality, diversity, and inclusion. And also, uh, in this line, we want to we want the award to support uh, uh, as many individual well, individuals in as many career states as possible. For this reason, we want we a minimum of, of 20% of the funding of full economic cost of the, of the awards must support the development of early career researchers, understood as postdoctoral researchers who have not yet established an academic, uh, who have not got yet to the academic independence. Also, 25% 20%, of the full economic cost of the awards must support, must support, must support the development of RTPs. These are research technical uh, professionals and include research technicians, core facilities staff, software developers, data engineers, etc. Also, one of the questions, and I will raise this point later, uh, included in the proposal, is that uh, the applicants should demonstrate the internal selection processes that they will carry out to select the individuals directly benefiting from the awards are transparent and fair. 
and we will assure the diversity of those benefiting from, from this award. Lastly, one, uh, and on, and one other point that we want to highlight is that the awardees will have to, re uh, to request the ADI data from individuals directly benefiting from the awards and report this to BBS, back to the BBSRC so that we can monitor uh, how the difference, uh, yeah, how, uh, how the, well, the ADI data of the individuals directly benefiting from the awards. This application, as you may know, is running in the new UKRI funding service and cannot be accessed using this, the previous UKRI funding service. Uh, this uh, project lead is responsible for completing the application process on, on, UK, on the UKRI funding service, but we expect all the team members and project partners to contribute to the application. Please note that only the research organization can submit the application to UKRI and that this leader research organization will be the sole partner in receipt of the funding, and then they will have to distribute it across the other partners. Uh, now I'm going to outline the application questions in the well, in the application in the application uh, in the application. First is the summary, in which we will have to provide a summary of the awards and how it fits the scope of the of the of the opportunity. Also, you have to include the, uh, the core team being the project lead, the arrow that will be leading the partnership, and the project colleagues being the other partners involved in the partnership. Again, please note that only the project lead will be able to access and lead the application on TFS. TFS is this fund in the new funding system. So please, so well. So it would recommend you to work on the on the application, on the application offline, and then when it's ready, uh, the application. Uh, we recommend the, the, the project lead to uh, upload all the text and all the document, uh, all the content of the application to TFS. Also, uh, as I have already mentioned, you'll have to highlight the priority area in which your project will be focusing. And uh, also, you have to include uh, the support letters from all the project partners. This can be either a letter or email of support. And then the main questions are the four. Uh, are four. The first one, uh, well, sorry, five. The first one is the proposed activities in which we want you to, uh, to describe which type of activities you will support with the award and how they align with the objectives of the opportunity. The second question is on the partnership and potential collaborators, focusing on how the award, uh, yeah, how the, uh, which part, which arose made up the partnership and how the award may benefit from the, uh, from these arrows working together and also which are the likely initial collaborators as I said in this at the start of the of this webinar these are not set in stone and they can develop over the course of the of the of the of the project also there's a question on operations and governance in which we ask you how the pro the partnership will be government uh, uh, which will, will be managed and which reporting process will be in place for the FTMA. Then we will have every question on the quality diversity and inclusion, and it's, it's lined up with the aspect I was mentioning before on how, uh, how the project will embed the ADI principles at all levels and all, and all aspects of the FTMA. And lastly, the justification of resources, explain outlining how do we spend the funding uh, uh, from the proposal from the, uh, during the during the during the course of the project. Uh, the, also, you can find the, the finding finder in the funding finder uh, website of UKRI how we how we will assess your application. The the, the the assessment will be through a panel of experts with relevant expertise and, tra and training development and intersector mobility and knowledge exchange. This panel will consist of members of the Bioscience Research Community and the staff from BBS Austin. We will use the recommendations of the panel along the overall funding opportunity requirements and the available budget in making the final funding decision. We will fund the high the highest score, the, the proposal with the highest score in each of the six priority areas, and then the remaining four awards will be granted based on the broad quality of the proposals. Regarding, about, regarding timelines for the call, as you know, the call is already open. It opens the 4th of September, and it will close on the 28th of November at 4 p.m. 
we strongly advise advise you to try to to submit your applications before this deadline, uh, preferably one day in advance at least, so that uh, we can we make sure that the we receive the application safely. Then uh, the, uh, the application will go through some internal checks to check that it fits the scope of the call, and then it will go to the panel assessment that I just mentioned. We aim to have a decision on the on which proposals we will be funding by March 2024, so that uh, the awardees can start delivering the activities from April 2024. And as I said at the start, uh, the it will be the award will last uh, over three. Uh, sorry, it will last for three years, finishing by March 2027. There will be three annual reports in April this year, starting in 2025, in which for which BBSRC will provide a form to complete to the uh, successful ROs. If you require any further information on this call, you can check uh, the UKRA website, in which you can find the information about on eligibility information, how, uh, the opportunity description, the application questions and the assessment criteria, and also the frequently asked questions document that we will upload as soon as possible after this webinar, as well as the recording of this webinar. If you have any further questions, you can get in touch with that by email in support at funding-service.ukri.org or by phone in this one well, you can see on the screen. And again, all this information is available on the uh, Funding Finder find, Funding Finder page at the BSRC website, sorry, UKRI website. And now, well, thank you very much. And uh, we will start answering the questions you may have. And for this, I'm going to try to start my video and stop sharing. And let's see if this works. Yeah. So. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. There's lots of questions flooding in. I've been trying, doing my best to answer them via text, um, but there's a number that I've not managed to get to yet. So we'll go ahead and answer those live uh, on camera. Um, so we've had a couple of questions around EDI and clarifying reporting of EDI data and what EDI data are expected. Um, so firstly, um, a good point is raised around anonymizing data. So I want to reassure you that in the reports we will be requesting annually, we will expect to see an overview of the EDI breakdown of your reward we won't want to see um individual named participants in fdma activities alongside all of their protected characteristics we would ask that you request that the individuals who are partaking in fdma activities provide edi data but of course it is entirely up to them whether they choose to do so they may choose not to disclose that information um, and you can find on the funding finder some information on what we might expect to see as a minimum on that EDI data. I will shortly post that into the Q&A so that you can see that written down and digest it a bit better that way. Um, a question here around collaborators and partners and who receives funding. So just to clarify, the partners of the awards or the lead partner will be the one in receipt of the funding and they will be responsible for delivering the FTMA activities. The collaborators don't receive the funding. It is spent by the partners, but the collaborators may be individuals who, for example, host a placement or who send a member of staff to provide some training to one of those partners. Hopefully that clarifies that. Please do feel free to put more questions into the chat. Um, what is expected with regards to project partner contributions? Can you give examples? So you might want to um, explain how the partnership benefits from bringing those two research organizations together. For example, perhaps one has a particularly strong link with one industrial partner and another 
has a particularly strong link with an indust- a different industrial partner. And by partnering together, you might be able to utilize those collaborators better together. You might want to um, describe how the governance of the FTMA scheme would be handled across the partners um, who might provide particular expertise in one area over another. It might be that given that we expect a certain amount of the awards to go to ECRs, 25% and another 25% to research technical professionals, it might be that you choose to partner with an organization who has a focus on assisting research technical professionals rather than ECRs, and that's how you're going to um, adhere to that particular point. Hopefully that's given you some ideas. Again, please feel free to ask further questions. Yeah, here I have a question that I will answer on the LGBT criteria for the project lead. The project lead, I mean, the lead itself is, is the arrow, for example, University of Manchester, or the University of Nottingham. And the LGBT criteria is that they are eligible for BBS, BBS, BBSRC funding. And that's the only criteria, I mean, all, and all the, I mean, and which arrows are eligible for, which research organizations are eligible for BBRC, for BBRC funding is something that you can find on our website. And also there's a link on the on the application on the uh, FTMA page on the opportunity page. Also, there's a question: if the collaborators can be international, yes, they can be internationals, but partners cannot be. I repeat this: partners can be international. Sorry, partners can, must be UK-based arrows and research organizations, but the Collaborators doesn't does not need to be academic institutions and that do not be, do not need do not be do not need to be from the UK. So it could be, for example, a university in France or a company in the Netherlands. Another question here around yeah. eligibility, specifically on project leads. So the question asks: Can the project lead be an RTP or professional services member of staff? Is there a, a requirement for the lead to be a research or academic member of staff? The project lead can be any member of staff that you choose um, to be responsible for the sort of project management of the grant as a whole. If you want that to be an RTP, it can be. If you think that's best place for professional services member of staff, it can be. If you'd like it to be a PI, it can be. It's up to you. A question around, can we include letters of support from likely collaborators who would want to be initial partners on the project. Um, there's no requirement to include letters of support for the collaborators. There is a requirement to provide letters of support for the partners. If you wish to provide letters of support for collaborators, I don't believe there is a function to do that. You would probably be best placed to just outline in your application that you have already reached out to these collaborators and that they are excited to work with you on the FTMA scheme. Can other collaborators be involved later on in the activities or only the ones who have been included in the application? Collaborators can be involved in later activities. Given that these are three-year awards, we do not expect you to have every single activity planned out in advance right from the get-go. We appreciate that there's going to be some amount of this award evolving over time, perhaps introducing new collaborators, perhaps reacting to what has worked in previous years of the award to develop slightly different activities. So yes, in short, collaborators can be involved in later activities, not just the ones named in the application. Similarly, you can bring in new collaborators as the award evolves. They're totally flexible. Would conference registration costs be an eligible cost if one is attended as part of an exchange activity? I think that's the key point at the end of that question. So if one is attended as part of an exchange activity and you can justify that it's a meaningful part of that exchange, then I think that that would be eligible. However, just using the FTMA award to send someone on a conference just for that purpose would not be an eligible cost. Someone requesting a recap on the decision-making process. 
I'm happy to do that. So we have our six priority areas. We expect all FTMA applicants to select one priority area for their FTMA, and we will fund or aim to fund one FTMA within each of those six priority areas. So the top scoring within each of those six will be awarded. That leaves four left over, and those remaining four will be awarded just based on how they have scored. So they could all end up being from one priority area, or they could be a mix. There's a, there's a question on saying, will this school be the only FTMA funding available through to 2028? We are planning. Potentially, yes, but it's not a fair answer. But potentially, this the idea of this, yeah, is this school running until 2027. So we're not expecting any to develop any other FTMA call until 2028. But we've not, I mean, it's not done. Setting a stone answer, it depends on how this call runs and how many interest there is from the community and also the funding, the internal media society funding decisions. So we, I mean, there's not a clear answer on that. A question here again around collaborators and partners. Um, so for example, Leeds can partner with Nottingham and they could collaborate with a university in Japan, but Japan would be a collaborator, not a partner. That is exactly correct. That's precisely why we've tried to use the distinct wording of partner and collaborator just to separate those, those two terms. But you're exactly correct in that assumption. Can you have multiple projects captured in one application, even if all partners are not involved in all activities? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, so we would expect your application to contain a number of projects. Um, again, they might not need to be given in explicit detail right from the get go. Um, <clears throat> you don't need to have every partner involved in every project. So let's say you have a collaboration between Warwick and Nottingham universities, uh, sorry, a partnership between Warwick and Nottingham universities. A, an individual from Warwick University could go on an FDMA placement to, say, AstraZeneca, who are a collaborator, um, without any involvement of Nottingham University. So again, it would be up to the partners to decide how they utilise the funding, how they split it between themselves. Yeah, here is an related question. And is, uh, will the funding be shared between partners? For example, for our supply and receive 25k per year across three years, it, can, it comes to the same. The uh, we, uh, the only the lead applicant will receive the money from the DSRC, and then is the lead applicant who will have to distribute however they think is best the funding. This is something that you may want to align in the governance of the project and how the project will be governance and managed. There is another one on the on how which proposal we will fund. Uh, uh, I'll explain it again. As, you, uh, as, as, as we've said, there are six priority areas, and we will find we will fund the highest scoring proposal from each priority area. Then the remaining four awards will be given to the proposals with the highest award, inde uh, independently of the priority area. So we might end up having a uh, five awards of one priority area, and then from the other six, so from the other six, if I vote five criteria, only one award per priority area. Yeah. Well, we understand that a co-lead or lead can't have this role on more than one FTMA applications. Would a co-lead or lead be able to have an exchange funded through acting as a collaborator in a separately funded FTMA? Yes, exactly. Um, can a collaborator receive funding from the grant, for example, in payment for providing training? Yes, 
that would come that would need to come from the award holder so the partners so bbsfc will deliver the funding to the partners who will then be responsible for utilizing that funding and they can use it to pay a collaborator in the example that you've given There is a question highlighting that this scheme will only benefit a few people in a limited number of arrows. And it would have been better if there were six national networks that all RTPs, et cetera, could have applied to. So we've tried the opposite. I mean, we've tried to maximize the number of arrows that can get involved in this call. That's why we are not allowing more than one, sorry, we're not allowing an arrow to apply to apply at for, I mean, to be a partner in more than one proposal and that we are requiring the application to come from partnerships so that at least we fund two, uh, two different roles. The idea that you said, uh, that is suggesting the question about funding national networks is that they are not eligible for BDSRC fund, funding. So we would not be able to, I mean, there, is, there needs to be a research organization that can allow uh, that manages that, the funding from BDSRC. So, I mean, the alternative is that one. Arrow, yeah, highlight. I mean, preparing a proposal in that line, for example. But we, I mean, this, that's not something that we can do. Can we run internal calls for exchanges using this FTMA funding? Yes, you can. And in fact, you might want to consider that the implications that would have on the EDI aspects of the call and the level of control that that might give you in uh, delivering the funding. So that could be a good approach um, to delivering FTMA funds. And it's one that has been used by uh, other organizations in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is, do the RTPs, do their research and technical professionals and early career researchers fund it by the 20% minimum allocation each need to be employed in the arrows they do not they don't need to be employed in the arrows for example it could be from of an overseas for example from an overseas institution to come to the uk so i mean you know it, it would be employed by the partner but they need to be staff from and also from england they could, they could be technical staff from the industry coming to the an academic setting so they don't have to be employed in the Partner, partners arrows. And also, the, I mean, this question has a second part on how about RTPs and ERs, ECRs funded by allocations above that 25% minimum? I mean, there's, I mean, there's a minimum, there is not a maximum, so you can, I mean, you can fund as many, I mean, as, as many as I mean, as much as you want, as long as you, I mean, you have all the quota sets up, so you could do twenty five percent for RCPs and seventy five percent for early career researchers, and that would be completely fine. So, a question here about whether a lead RO can be a partner on a second application. No, uh, eligible research organisations are limited to being a partner on only one application, whether they are considered the lead partner or a co partner. You can only be a partner on a single application. You can be a collaborator on as many applications as you like. Question around the definition of ECR. Um, so for the purposes of this call, we would define an ECR as a postdoctoral academic who has yet to achieve academic independence. So most commonly that's postdoctoral researchers. Um, in certain situations that could be 
certain fellows, for example, our discovery fellows would also fall into that category. It's worth noting that the FDMAs can be used to support a diverse range of staff. So principal investigators and permanent academics um, can benefit from the FTMA award, but they wouldn't fall within that 25% minimum expected to go towards what we define as ECRs. If a KTP applies, is this counted as a submission from the member universities of that KTP, making their universities ineligible to act as a partner on another award? Or is that counted as the KTP submission, allowing the member universities to act as partners on another application? I will double check this and we will make sure it is provided in the FAQ document that we will upload to the web page at the end. However, I believe that at present that would mean that the in that given situation if the KTP applied as a partner that would mean that all of those universities are involved as a partner and therefore ineligible to be a partner on another award. I appreciate that this is a bit of a change from prior FTMA awards where for example we've invited certain networks and other KTPs to be involved as independent award holders and that isn't the case for this round. However, we do specifically encourage the FTMA awards to be utilized to benefit existing uh, funds and networks, KTPs, uh, SLOLAs, fellowships, et cetera, are all good examples of that. So if you are in a KTP and you are aware of FTMA awards that have been given to some of your um, particular universities, we would encourage you to get in touch with them and consider how you can be involved in their FTMA award. And we would encourage applicants to include in their application how they will be utilising such networks within their award. Another question here around priority areas. So please, can you clarify the priority areas? Are projects not focusing on the priority areas likely to be funded? Or are you only anticipating funding in those priority areas? Linked to that, the four funded projects outside the first six, will they be ranked irrespective of priority area? So we expect all applicants to indicate a primary priority area which they feel their FTMA best aligns with and therefore will only be funding awards within those priority areas. Before I move on to the next question, I would just like to remind you that there is a lot of flexibility within that stipulation. So firstly, we would expect some, uh, we expect 70% FEC of the grant to go towards activities within that priority area. So you still have a 30% left over that you can do reasonably whatever you want with, within the uh, aims of the scheme. And then within that 70% funding, there's actually quite a lot of flexibility as to what that could be used for. So you could, for example, um, if you chose the data intensive bioscience priority area, you could take an individual who works in that area and send them on a training course or on a placement related to that area. Or you could take that individual and send them on something that's actually not relevant to that area for example, transferable skills development, or you could take someone from a different area entirely and train them within that remit. So there's actually quite a lot of flexibility there. Um, 
The second part of the question, the four funded projects outside of the first six, will they be ranked irrespective of priority area? Yes, that is the intention. There's a question on what the colleagues should add to the value of the FTMA. If we are talking about the COIs being in different uh, in different sectors, or if they could be both in the same sector and provide other types of benefits to the partnership. That I mean, both options are fine. I mean, it could be either two, I mean, a partnership made up of two research organizations, they can be in the same sector and they having for example, a different set of international collaborators or a different set of equipment that could be used, or they could be in two completely, com two completely different sectors, for example, uh, agriculture and, bio and biotechnology, uh, sorry, bioinformatics, and that they want to collaborate, uh, putting, an uh, putting a bit together. So both, op both options are within the scope of the core. Could you clarify the ways in which collaborators can financially receive funding or benefits through the scheme? You mentioned paying for training. What about the lead RO paying their travel costs, consumables and researcher time? Um, travel costs and consumables are absolutely eligible costs. So if you have, for example, a collaborator who specializes in delivering training you could pay for their travel costs you could pay for their fees to have them come out and train your staff if you were sending someone to a business you could pay the travel costs to get someone there and to pay for the consumables for the research to be conducted while they are there and you could cover the researcher's salary for the duration at which they are at that exchange hopefully that's clarified some of that As the awards are funding and 80% APC, should there be a commitment from partners and NIMS collaborators to cover the additional 20%? Yes, this, I mean, we fund 20% of the awards, the remaining 20% should be covered by the ROs, the partner ROs, and they can, I mean, and they can try to fund the funding anywhere as somewhere else. If they fund, for example, an industrial collaborator that is willing to, to top up this 20%, they could do that, but it's it's at, at the end, it's possible of the arrows of the partner arrows to identify 20%. Sorry, there's so many questions coming in that my, my question page is splitting around a bit. Please bear with me. So can you explain the reasons behind the need for two arrows? I, why was this decision made, given that in the past, this was not the case? Thank you for answering that question. We're always happy to kind of receive those sorts of questions and explain the rationale behind our decisions. So this was made ultimately because we are aware that we can only make 10 awards and we want to diversify the spread of funding. And this was a good way to achieve that. Do you have a definition of what is interdisciplinary or is it for us to argue? We don't have a strict definition. Um, it, it would be for you to argue. Um, and it, it does depend a little bit on the activity and what it is you're trying to achieve. So to provide an example of what clearly we wouldn't consider interdisciplinary, if you have someone who is working on um, a niche a niche protein and a niche organism and you wanted to send them to another lab who are also working on that same protein but perhaps in a slightly different organism we wouldn't consider that interdisciplinary but if they were going to learn very um new techniques in a, a to be applied in a different way then you could argue that that would be interdisciplinary I apologize that that is quite vague. Um, we, we don't want to put a hard limit on what we consider interdisciplinary. 
you are free to ask questions using the um, given uh, inbox, which is posted on the Funding Finder page, and we will do our best to get back to you. If an arrow is a collaborator of on an award, does that mean that their staff cannot benefit from the scheme if their arrow is not a partner on the award? No, the staff employed by collaborators can be benefit from the awards. For example, uh, a research uh, and, res and research in the industry can benefit from the awards going to uh, the ac to academic sector or uh, or from an international academic organization, they can benefit from it, or a UK research organization that is a collaborator, is named as a collaborator. Well, it's not named, named because they do collaborators do not need to be, be named in the application, but you now the answer is no, it's, it's tough from collaborators can benefit from the awards, but it's up to the partners to decide how they will be selected and with, with which criteria. Could you please clarify the rationale for restricting most of the applications to a specific priority area? Yes, again, thank you for questioning our rationale. Um, so this gives us some measure of control to ensure that our funding is appropriately spread to what we consider to be our strategic priorities and avoids a situation where, for example, all FTMA funding goes towards a particular remit. We want to avoid that situation. That's why we have the need for specific priority areas. Do appreciate that part of the call, part of the intention of the call is for it to be flexible. And that is why we reduced that down from requiring that all activities are within the priority area to 70% of the FEC and also tried to retain some flexibility within that. Thank you for the question. I appreciate that we're getting quite close to the hour and I don't want us to go over time. There are a number of questions remaining in the chat. So I'd just like to take this opportunity to explain to you what we're going to do from here. So firstly, this webinar has been recorded and it's going to be uploaded onto the Funding Finder webpage alongside the call. Secondly, we're going to go through all the questions that you have asked, especially including the ones that we've not yet answered. And we're going to include them in an FAQ document. So we will do our best to get accurate, precise answers to each of those and include them in the FAQ document, which will also be added to the web page. So apologies if you have asked a question that has not yet been answered. We will do our best to get answers to those questions and to make them publicly available for everyone. Um, I think at this stage, all that's left to do is to thank you all very much for coming. We've had a really good turnout and you've been very engaged and asked lots of questions and to wish you best of luck in your application and to also thank Javier for presenting to us and helping in answering the questions. So thank you all. I think we'll close it there. Thank you, everyone. And um, yeah, thank you. Let's open the questions. So we understand.